with him. It's a great pleasure to introduce Matt Cliff. Uh, he's actually an assistant professor at Nottingham University. He got his PhD from Oxford in 2015 and spent a couple of years in Cambridge as a postdoc before starting his independent career in 2018. Uh, he's going to show us metal organic frameworks, but not only how to make them, but how to make them effective and useful. And uh, that's a very tough challenge. Uh, but it goes along the way, structure property relationship. Looking forward to your talk, Matt. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks. So yeah, uh, as, as, uh, as the Mohammed said, um, I'm going to be telling you about uh, a metal organic frameworks and a few uh, coordination frameworks. And so I guess what I mean by that is, is uh, not just things that have potential porosity, but also things that uh, are, are dense and also some inorganic ligands as well. But the key thing here is that everything I'm talking about is going to have molecular ligands. So that's why I've used this idea of, uh, let's see if I can get this right, it's uh, coordination frameworks uh, rather than just purely dense inorganic materials. Um, and th I guess the focus here is that uh, we've seen how metal organic frameworks and coordination frameworks in other talks uh, can be really useful for separations, for uh, catalysis, and other kinds of uh, you know, chemical properties. But I want to emphasize here that perhaps they could also be useful, and maybe convince you by the end of my talk, that they could also be useful for their physical properties, their, uh, their magnetism, their electric properties. And so potentially uh, we can harness their, uh, you know, their interesting properties uh, for uh, quantum applications as well. And I think I kind of don't really need this slide anymore because of the great introduction we had earlier from, uh, from many talks, including uh, Judith. But the basic, uh, basic idea here is that in terms of computation, we're kind of running up against the materials barrier in terms of silicon. And what we need is, is materials uh, that can go past this, that can compute in different ways, store and transform information uh, in ways other than just the conventional uh, band semiconductors like silicon. Uh, and I think uh, quantum materials, materials with strong electronic correlations, are, are one of the most promising ways of doing this. Uh, uh, whether this is uh, through sort of uh, superconductivity and, and qubits in, in, in that sense, or uh, coupling magnetism and electricity in magnetoelectrics, or in you know, topological quantum uh, type uh, computing, things like spin liquids, uh, which are a very uh, you know, hot topic in terms of uh, condensed matter physics at, at the moment. So one of the things you'll notice about all these three materials, these kind of three uh, you know, really quite well studied materials, is they're all, they're all dense and inorganic. Um, and that's true of pretty much all the, the materials in these families that are being studied at the moment. And so why would you want to look at uh, materials or molecules in with hybrid frameworks? Well, I, I think there's, there's obviously, other than the fact that there are new materials, we don't know what they will do, we don't know that what their capabilities will be. I think there's, there's two main things. The first is that when you go from a single atom to a molecule, you've introduced additional degrees of freedom, and so you can order those additional degrees of freedom and produce properties that you can't get in purely inorganic materials. The second thing, and this is really, I think, shown for uh, the chemical properties in, in uh, Mohammed's talk on, on the first day, um, the modularity of, of hybrid frameworks, the fact you can functionalize organic ligands while keeping the topology of the materials the same, gives you a potential for rational design that's, that's much more challenging in dense, inorganic materials. So effectively, you've decoupled the topology the, of a lattice from the interactions, because by changing the functional groups in the material, you can potentially uh, control these independently. And there's, this is a, a, a potential for design, which is, is uh, I think, really exciting. So before I get onto the, the science uh, uh, that I'm going to talk to you today, I just thought I'd highlight the people who've done uh, the work. So, so my group in Nottingham and, and collaborators, and in particular, uh, the center facilities, who uh, people working at synchrotrons and neutron sources, who the beamline scientists there, who've really made this uh, possible. And um, I'd just like to flag those people there. Um, OK. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about is how moving from atoms to molecules can give you new kinds of ordering. And for this, I'm going to look at pseudo-halides. 
Um, so what, what's a pseudo halide? It's a, a molecule that behaves like a halide. So you're going from uh, something like bromide to something like thiocyanate. All right. And so thiocyanate is a, is a really well known, really well understood uh, in, in terms of perhaps its structural chemistry uh, molecule. And it turns out that it has uh, structural chemistry quite similar to bromide overall. All right. So that this concept of pseudo halideness is, is maybe 100 years old. Um, and uh, the crystal structure of this particular material, nickel thiocyanate, is, is also pretty old as well. But if you, you look, you can see the comparison here between the two structures. So you've got this uh, octahedral layers, uh, edge sharing, uh, that stack into, in two dimensions. Uh, and it's the same as for this material here, except now you've broken the symmetry because you've, you've, got a, you've got a rod rather than a ball. You, you've stretched it out along a single dimension that's lowered the symmetry. But what's, I think, really neat about this, and we did a little bit of work uh, exploring this, is that the, not, as well as this structural similarity, there's also magnetic similarity. Not just um, in, so you, you get similar kinds of orderings. So uh, nickel bromide and the other nickel halides in, in have a single layer, uh, potential single layer ferromagnetism. So they're, they're bulk anti-ferromagnets, but each, within each layer, the spins are pointing in the same direction, at least in the higher temperature of the two ordered phases for nickel bromide. And the same is true for nickel thiocyanate. So we use neutron diffraction to determine the magnetic structure of this, um, and uh, uh, a bunch of other uh, metal uh, binary thiocyanates which hadn't been made before. Um, but what's interesting is it's not just that the ground states are similar, the interactions are of similar magnitude. Right? Just, this is a much longer ligand than bromide, but the interactions are, in fact, comparably strong because of the good energy and orbital overlap in these materials. Um, so, yeah, we, we've, we made a whole range of, of these different materials and understand their, their magnetic orderings. But what uh, I've emphasized so far the similarities, but they're also significantly different in their structural chemistry. And uh, the obvious thing to do is to go from these binary materials and to try and make these ABX3, um, these uh, uh, perovskite structured materials, right? That's, that's, you know, every solid state chemist is, is a huge fan or at least has a grudging respect for perovskites. And so this is what we wanted to realize in, in thiocyanate. And if you do the simple thing of taking nickel thiocyanate and combining it with cesium, thiocyanate to make ABX3, um, you don't end up with a perovskite, but you end up with a post-perovskite. And for those of you who aren't uh, mineralogists in the audience, this is a, a post-perovskite because it occurs deeper within the Earth than the magnesium silicate uh, perovskite, which is uh, so abundant. So this is occurring at hundreds of GPA and, and you know, extremely high temperatures as well. Um, but because the structural chemistry of thiocyanate is different to oxide and, and the other halides, we can realize this in, in water in, at room temperature. We can make uh, large single crystals of this material. So to, to show the difference in the structure, instead of having all corner-sharing octahedra as you would in normal perovskite, you now have these edge-sharing chains, which means it's two-dimensional. There's, in fact, now two chemically distinct uh, nickels in this material as well due to the... This has got four uh, nitrogens. This has only got two. So we grew large single crystals of cesium nickel thiocyanate and also uh, the manganese and cobalt analogs. And using uh, single crystal neutron diffraction in combination with powder and, and bulk measurements, we were able to characterize its magnetic properties and determine that these, in fact, have really quite complicated magnetic structures. And this is something that wasn't really known about post-perovskites because you can't make a single crystal large enough for these sort of uh, studies, at least uh, not without, uh, no one has as far as I know so far. So uh, what's interesting here is that the cesium nickel thiocyanate is not just non-collinear. Uh, there's more than two different directions in it. There's, there's three, in fact, distinct ones here. So the green spins and the purple spins are both tilted so they're not quite opposite to each other. And they're pointing in opposite directions. So even if you use bulk magnetometry here, you'd be able to tell that this is a canted antiferromagnet, but you would probably have underestimated the degree to which it is canted, because you've got these two cancelling different factors here. So I think what, what's interesting about this is that using this kind of advanced characterization, we're able to uh, uncover things uh, about these uh, even in some sense quite chemically simple materials that we wouldn't anticipate. And these non-coplanar uh, spin structures are, I think, of general interest at the moment uh, for their potential in, in, um, in, in uh, magnetic uh, data storage and, and things like that, so skirmionic phases and such.
So how do you make a perovskite? We still want to make one, right? That's still a target of, of ours. And then you need to think more carefully about the chemistry. So uh, the nitrogen end and the sulfur end want to bind to different things. Nitrogen is, is chemically harder, wants to bind to things like the first row transition metals. Sulfur, softer, so later transition metals, and also some P-block elements. So what you need to do is to combine two of them. You need to make a, a double perovskite. Now, but there are a handful of elements that would do both. Uh, cadmium is the example, and you can make, indeed, cesium, cadmium, uh, trithiocyanate. So what we did was we took bismuth, um, because it's the most... Uh, it's, it's the cheapest and also uh, probably the least toxic out of the ones that you have on offer for the sulfur end, and then combined it with the first row transition metals. And we managed to make this... Uh, uh, Prussian blue analog perovskite without uh, an acyte cation material. It's very strongly colored. It's a little bit hard to see here, uh, but this is uh, a very, very dark green, and the chromium is a, is a kind of brick red color. Um, and it's got this nice uh, three-dimensionally connected uh, uh, REO3 uh, perovs uh, acyte vacancy perovskite uh, Prus uh, Prussian blue analog structure. Um, the other thing you'll notice is it's really distorted. In fact, if you, if you stretch this out to be cubic, it would have a volume that would be twice as large. And this is coming about from the thiocyanate bonding preferences. The sulfur p orbital really enforces that kind of distortion in it. So you can put acyte cations in it. So if you use cadmium, uh, 2 plus 2 plus, this is work from uh, Xiaoming Chen's group. Uh, they were able to include ammonium, make the, the full uh, ABX3 perovskite. Uh, and we found that if you use a 2 plus and a 3 plus, you can make these, uh, these um, ones with one potassium and one vacancy in the material. And these are very well-ordered materials. So you can go from one side to the other. And these all, in fact, have basically the same structure, except for the fact that uh, these are slightly sheared. So they have the same uh, other, the other orderings are identical, except for the fact there's some shear in it here. This is uh, unusual. It's columnar order. So into the board, there's a, a huge column of, of these, uh, of these one, one plus cations. Ideally, though, we'd like to be including a molecular cation for the reasons I kind of outlined at the beginning. Maybe we could introduce some polarity with it. Um, and what we, used to, um, what we used before we started synthesizing was this a tolerance factor approach that uh, uh, Tony introduced uh, with uh, Gregor Kieslik and uh, Xi Jing Sun for uh, our hybrid perovskites. Uh, and we, we came up with some uh, a shape parameters for thiocyanate and then calculated where uh, various different hybrid thiocyanate perovskites would, would fit in this. Uh, and what we found was that it, none of them really lie in the expected uh, region, but on the basis of things that did exist, the cesium cadmium and the uh, ammonium cadmium nickel, we thought that because of this vacancy, which makes your acyte cation effectively smaller, you might be able to make guanidinium and methyl ammonium nickel bismuth thiocyanate. And indeed, well, certainly for the methyl ammonium, you can. So before I go on to show you the structure, I thought I'd just briefly re recap some of the key orders. So you have cation order on the, metal, on the uh, framework metal site, the M site or B site. So you can have rock salt order, layered order, columnar order. And in this material, you, you've got the, you're always going to get rock salt order. And that's because of that chemical difference I outlined earlier. You can get A site order as, uh, as well. So you could have rock salt, layered, and columnar order. And these are the three uh, most uh, high symmetry orderings you can get. And the methyl ammonium nickel bismuth thiocyanate, you get none of them. That was all a, a distraction. In the A site, you get these two by three by one blocks um, of methyl ammonium surrounded by vacancies. So the unit cell of this is very, very large. Um, uh, but you can see, uh, from, because it's a single crystal data, you can see uh, the orderings in this particular uh, direction here. Um, so, so what is causing this? Well, we think uh, the first thing I guess to highlight is that there's also um, some very... Oh, hang on, have I missed the slide? No. So is, is the, is there's also a tilting in the structure. So if you have octahedron, connect them by the corners, um, then they, they're under constraint, they can tilt. And this is what... This is what uh, it looks like. So if one rotates clockwise, the next one rotates anti-clockwise, and so on and so forth. But this doesn't constrain the layers above and below it. So you could do it in phase, or you could do it out of phase. Or indeed, in methyl ammonium nickel bismuth thiocyanate, you could do it three one way and then three the other. So um, there's a lot of animations going on here. Um, I'm not 
saying that you will be able to figure out what's going on here. We use symmetry analysis to, to really nail down what's happening. Uh, and the high, this very open structure doesn't exist. This is just the uh, Arisa type which allowed us to determine the symmetry of it. So this is a really complicated tilt. In oxides, there's only maybe one or two different materials, sodium niobate, which have this tilt. And in methyl ammonium nickel bismuth, you have this six period tilt along one axis and a four period tilt on another. And the reason for this, we think, is to make space for the methyl ammonium. So you've got very, very different sizes. You've got an empty space, and you've got methyl ammonium, and you need to get the thiocyanate out of the way in order to fit the methyl ammonium in. And none of the most common tilt patterns that you get, none of the most common ways of doing those orderings, will let you do it, right? So, for example, the potassium one here has three thiocyanates in every cage, which is uh, what you'd expect on average, whereas in this one here, you get a mixture of three, two, zero, and two, and all the cages which are empty of four thiocyanates in. So there's a very strong coupling between the tilt pattern and the A-site order. Um, and what's neat about this is that these more complicated tilts actually allow you to, to break the center of symmetry, which is impossible for the more simple ones. Um, so this is a hypothetical material, uh, which has a slightly more complicated uh, composition uh, and what we think about this one here is if you try to make this material, then it would adopt this tilt, which has no center of symmetry. So this is a, a stable material. Um, it does have mixed valence on the iron site, so uh, whether it's possible to make it or not is an interesting question. Um, but it certainly suggests that these thiocyanate materials have ways of realizing more complex orders. So the, the next thing I want to go on to is talking about this potential for rational design, and, you, and in particular about quantum magnetism. Um, and molecular uh, hybrid materials are, are really well known for their potential for, for quantum magnetism, basically because the coupling through ligands, the larger ligands, allows you to reduce the dimensionality of your material and get to those sort of 1D or 2D quantum phases that you that, uh, that is of, of such a theoretical uh, interest. Indeed, like the first example of a topological phase, the Haldane S equals 1 chain, uh, it's an antiferromagnetic chain which has uh, uh, a spin gap that only comes about, so there's, there's a region of energies that you can't get to um, just because of the topology. So this is, uh, one, this is a, a Nobel Prize winning uh, theoretical prediction, and then it was realized uh, later on in the uh, later 80s in this uh, nickel nitrite uh, coordination polymer. But this, so you can get Haldane phases for S equals 1, where you have two unpaired electrons, but also Hypothetically, you could make them for two, S equals 2, S equals 3, 4, 5, etc., etc. If you have an even number of electrons, you should be able to get this because it's all about this, uh, this bonding type interaction between the two different spins. Um, it turns out, though, that no one's managed to make one yet. And that's in part because as you move from the S equals 1 to S equals 2, you're becoming a little bit less quantum and you're not able to um, necessarily uh, get to get all your parameters fine-tuned enough to be able to realize this. So it's, it's a bit more challenging. So the system that we decided to, to see if we could realize this in are these layered um, metal chloride, uh, layered uh, metal chloride uh, and heterocyclic materials, in particular these metal dichloride uh, pyrimidines. And these are, are, have been shown already that you can use them to tune the magnetism in the materials. They have these strongly coupled uh, one-dimensional metal chloride chains. Um, and by changing the ligands, so these are three different crystal structures of the uh, pyrimidine, uh, the bi 4 4 bipy and the 4 4 uh, azo, uh, azo bipyridine uh, materials, uh, you can change the uh, magnetic, uh, um, in this case, the low field magnetic uh, uh, transition. So this is uh, work from about a decade ago from, uh, from a Spanish group. So um, what we were looking, thought these would be a really interesting way, particularly because they're reported not to magnetically order, at least the examples that are known, to explore for this Haldane, uh, Haldane phase. Um, and other kinds of quantum properties. So um, I learned uh, earlier uh, this... Um, earlier at this conference that, uh, in fact, we did already have a, quant a very quantum example of a, uh, of a metal chloride uh, pyramidy material, and that's a zinc example because this is a diamagnet, and, and this is, of course, a quantum property, as we, we saw uh, when, uh, from uh, Andre Geim's talk uh, earlier. But we, we want to get the Haldane phase, so we're not going to look at that anymore. We're going to go to the chromium-2 analog instead. So chromium-2, four unpaired electrons. You, you have a choice if you want four unpaired electrons of chromium-2 or iron-2. 
Iron 2 has a significant spin orbit component, which means that we can't really use it for this sort of thing. It uh, has very different behavior. Um, but we managed to make this chromium 2 material. Chromium 2 is a little bit air sensitive, but the material is, is itself actually not so bad uh, once you've made it. And it does form the structure you expect it to, um, with a large Jan-Teller distortion confirming the chromium 2. So the two chloride, chromium chloride bonds are much longer than the other two here. And this is uh, from single crystal. If you look at the magnetic properties of this material, it's an antiferromagnet, as you need for this. So it's, it's, you need an antiferromagnetic chain to get the Haldane properties. Um, and uh, what you see from this here is it orders at about 20 Kelvin, uh, and the heat capacity also shows this ordering transition as well. And the spin is, is S equals 2, as, as you'd hope. But this is only gives us a little bit of the information that we need to understand its magnetic behavior. So again, we went to do some neutron scattering, this time uh, at the ILL in, in Grenoble in France, and we're able to fit uh, and solve the magnetic structure of this material. And what we found is that along the metal chloride chains, it is indeed antiferromagnetic, as we needed and wanted. Um, but through the pyrimidine, actually, it's ferromagnetic. The spins tend to line up. And in between the layers, it's, it's ferromagnetic, though that is a much, much weaker interaction, as you'll see on the next slide. So we're able to fit this uh, material here. And there's also some evidence of low dimension ordering. So this is our neutron diffraction data. It's a subtraction of the data measured at 1.5 Kelvin from 30 Kelvin um, overall. So we really need to be able to know what the interactions um, are to really diagnose what's going on in this. And the neutron diffraction is only telling us about the ground state. It's only telling us about the static structure rather than any kind of evidence about what the strongest interactions are. So we did some spectroscopy. And this was measured at LET, at ISIS. This is probably a little bit harder to see uh, just because of the uh, of our lights, unfortunately. But this is our experimental data. We fitted it using linear spin wave theory and spin W. And uh, uh, essentially, th this here is just your, if you just looked at the, uh, the uh, e delta E equals zero line, that's just your neutron powder diffraction pattern. And these are your, and it's uh, significantly stronger than what we're seeing here. So that's why it's all uh, whited out or yellowed out, I guess. And this here are your magnons, your magnetic excitations. So by fitting these here, you can see that the strongest interaction is through the chromium chloride chain as we need. It's antiferromagnetic. The coupling between the chains is ferromagnetic in an order of magnitude weaker. And then in between the layers, basically, we can't detect it. So, but we know what sign it has to be. We also see there's a, a significant but small single ion anisotropy as well. Um, and this is something we want to avoid for the Haldane phase, it turns out. So I've spoken to Metz for a while. Is this a Haldane phase material? Uh, no, basically. Uh, so in the ordered phase, it's, so you need to be looking above the ordering transition in order to see it. And what you'd expect to see would be an area with no energy excitations here. Noth uh, so uh, an energy range where there's no excitations, uh, a gap, as, as it were. And there isn't a gap um, in the 25 Kelvin data we measured at LET. Uh, there's a continuum of excitations coming up here. It's, in fact, we're probably at too high temperatures to be able to see it. You'd need to be able to measure at 2 Kelvin in a disordered phase. So we need to suppress TN, and we need to decrease the anisotropy to realize this material. And this is something that we're uh, now actively exploring synthetically. But the great thing about these materials is that we do have this potential. We know that, in fact, yeah, I can talk about this uh, to anyone who's interested later. We, we, we know various ways that we can tune, say, the ordering temperature, the interactions, uh, the single line anisotropy as well. So I think this is a kind of interesting example of how you could use these sort of uh, uh, metal organic uh, magnetic materials uh, as uh, model uh, systems to explore quantum magnetism. So yeah, we also uh, uh, collaborated with Andrew Morris at Birmingham, who really uh, helped us understand a lot more about the origins of interactions and perhaps move forward in a predictive way here. So this is DFT plus U calculations on, on the structure, um, which allow us to see uh, the super exchange mechanism a little bit through the looking at the HOMO and the LUMO and the spin density uh, that there is there. And we also get the band structure, which tells you that it's, it's effectively uh, relatively isolated. It's not terribly dispersive. OK, so the last thing that I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit about is, is, is to the importance of defects and the importance of, of characterizing defects in these sorts of, of materials. And I think this is really well illustrated by the three examples that I showed you at the beginning. If you cast you all the way back to that first slide, don't worry, I'm not going to flick back through however many slides. Um, 
Uh, just there's, there's the cuprates, there's the YMGO, and there's the uh, colossal magnetoresistance material. All of these are disordered, and the disorder is intrinsic to their function. So we need to be able to control disorder and defects. We heard this earlier about uh, the disordered rock salt materials, how disorder is, is critical to their function, and controlling it is, 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 is very important. It's also true for these sort of magnetic and electronic materials as well. And cuprates are, I think, the, the best example because if you look at the stoichiometric material, it's an antiferromagnet. It's interesting, but it, it's not, and nowhere near as interesting as the superconductivity, which arises in about an eighth doping of holes or electrons. So we're going to have to have this kind of chemical control in, uh, in, in these quantum materials, uh, metal organic materials as well. And I think uh, one of the things that's important to emphasize is that even in really simple materials, you get these defects. Um, so if you go to the rock salt transition metal monoxides, um, cobalt, nickel, manganese oxide, and go to the earlier transition metals, so titanium, niobium, uh, vanadium, you get a lot of, a lot of uh, shock key vacancies, so you're missing cation and pairs. And these have, uh, and the ordering of these vacancies, so this is a uh, titanium monoxide from a work from, I think, from John Goodenough from a little while ago. Um, depending on whether those vacancies are ordered in the monoclinic phase here, which you can see here, or the uh, disordered cubic phase, you have very different uh, resistivity. So uh, understanding and controlling defects is, is important, even in the simplest materials uh, that, that uh, you, you can think of compositionally. One of the things that I think is quite neat about these molecular frameworks is that we can often characterize these defects very well. So we made some effectively defective examples of this uh, metal bismuth thiocyanate by substituting a 2 plus cation and not letting it, ha and trying to avoid giving it an A-site cation that would allow it to form those structures I showed you earlier. And what we found is that depending on the metal, depending on the synthesis conditions, we got a whole range of really quite complicated defect structures. Um, and so there's five different structures here, uh, and each of them basically occurs only for a single metal apart from this one here. And they're very, vo uh, it's, and they're very different on a local level. So the main, th sorry, I should highlight the main thing that you're getting here is you're getting bismuth hexathiocyanate of vacancies, like the cyanide Prussian blues, if you're familiar with those. And uh, so what happens is that you need to have some other kinds of defects to compensate for that. And they're varied, so you can get uh, adventitious A sites, so you can get those kind of uh, A site cations charge balancing, as we saw uh, uh, earlier on for the stoichiometric materials. Uh, you get uh, anti site disorder uh, with large water clusters around it because these materials are bigger. Uh, you get other kinds of uh, A site. Uh, uh, being accommodated on the B site effectively. You get la very large water clusters, which we can resolve from single crystal diffraction. And you also get uh, neutral species, just hydrogen bonded into the framework. Um, so there's a lot of chemical complexity here that we're able to resolve only through the use of single crystal. And this is coming about in part because of we've got, now we've got molecular uh, components, so that the range of different options you have is, is much broader. So these vacancies also order, and they order in complex patterns. So these three are experimental uh, ordering patterns. Um, they're pretty large unit cells. Um, uh, but again, if you order these in the right way, you can generate polarity. So this is a, a hypothetical ordering that's quite closely related to the one up here. But instead of there being a, a repeat of three, there's a repeat of four. And then this would be polar. So again, it's a different way of realizing function uh, in these materials through their uh, additional degrees of freedom that you get in, mo in molecules. The final example uh, uh, I'm going to tell you about is uh, one of my uh, favorite metal organic frameworks, UIO66. Um, so it's a zirconium or hafnium or uh, material principally, though there's all kinds of other 4-plus transition metals that have been made. We heard about it a little bit earlier. It effectively has face-centered cubic ar arrangement of these clusters. And they're connected uh, through linear ligands, typically terephthalic acid, benzene, 1,4-dicarboxylic uh, acid, uh, into this face center cubic structure. And it turns out that because it's high connectivity, you can take all sorts of stuff out of it, and it'll still hold together. In particular, you can remove large numbers of vacancies with uh, appropriate kind of chemical synthesis. Um, and this. If you do that, they tend to order, and this ordering produces defect nanodomains uh, of this uh, REO-structured uh, material, which you can see in the primitive diffuse scattering. So this is actually like some of the slightly ordered phases in the disordered rock salts. 
Um, so this is like an NBO type ordering within the MNO type matrix uh, in, in sort of an oxide family. So you've now gone from 12 connected to 8 connected. And these domain sizes are, uh, as you'll see, um, on the orders of sort of 2 to 10 nanometers, though it depends on the synthesis conditions. So we, we initially worked this out using uh, powder diffraction, but subsequently this has been verified by some really brilliant high-resolution TEM work uh, at KAUST, and then in collaboration with uh, Sean Collins, who's now at uh, uh, Leeds, uh, using some scanning electron diffraction. So I'm not sure it's really easy to see here, but I'll just explain what, what, what's going on. So effectively, this purple bit is, a, is a, the complete crystal of, of your UIO66, and these green streaks here are just images and these are about 100 nanometers, so this is about 100 nanometers long, 20 nanometers wide, uh, images of the domains of this REO phase. Uh, and this was done using scanning electron diffraction, so taking diffraction patterns at pretty much every single uh, point in this image here. So I think what's really neat about this is the way that we can realize these really quite complex defect structures in metal organic frameworks and in fact, under, begin to understand what's going on. In this case, uh, as you can probably even see in this little cartoon picture, so in this cartoon, the orange structures are the uh, REO phase domains, the purple is your FCU structure. You can see probably a little bit that this is more porous, and you can see this in gas absorption measurements. It also gives you potential for additional catalytic activity and so on and so forth. It actually also seems to affect the thermal expansion as well. So we have synthetic control on this. And the reason I think this kind of defect is, is so important is um, essentially that it's not just low temperature quantum applications that MOFs are going to be interesting for. It's actually high temperature, you know, really practical things. So this is a, a recent work from Casper uh, Pedersen and Rodolphe Clarat. Um, where they showed that if you go from this nickel chloride pyrazine, very closely related to the material I showed you earlier, um, to this chromium one, you increase the uh, magnetic ordering by a factor of a thousand because essentially you've reduced the ligand and made a radical ligand material. And this is about as strong as you can get in super exchange, pretty much. Um, so there's all kinds of different ways you can exploit this chemistry, but we're going to really need to understand the role of defects in it, and in particular, see if we can start to dope it. And so this is what my uh, recent project that's about to start is on. So doping-induced uh, strongly correlated MOFs, or, or disco MOFs. Um, yeah, obviously, the acronym came before the, uh, the, the individual words. And so what we're going to be trying to do over, over the next few years is, is use character, uh, advanced characterization to understand the role of doping uh, in these materials and see if we can realize some interesting uh, quantum function. And on that note, uh, I'd like to finish, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matt. That was great. The floor is open for questions. Yes, please. Yeah, nice talk with lots of interesting compounds. Uh, so, concerning this double-double perovskite, mm -hmm. uh, you have always tried with bismuth or cadmium. Is there a specific reason? Because... Yeah, uh, I'll see if I can skip back to it. But basically the reason is that you need something that the sulfur end of your thiocyanate is going to bond to. Mm -hmm. um, and that turns out to be relatively specific. So, if you go back to the periodic table that I had, I think, here, what you'll see is that, I didn't really explain this in much detail, but if it's colored purple, um, uh, so I guess this is a very sort of uh, low rent version of materials informatics, I went into CSD and ICSD and found all the structures that had uh, hexa uh, mono homoleptic uh, six thiocyanates round a metal. If it was nitrogen bound, it's purple. If it was um, sulfur bound, it's orange. And if it was both, then it's, uh, it's, it's dashed. And so what you can see is that if you wanted to bind to the sulfur, you're basically in this bit of the periodic table. It has to be pretty soft. Um, some of these don't form octahedral complexes because of the um, uh, because of just the, uh, they prefer to be lower coordinates. Uh, this is as well. Um, so you're really quite restricted. And so you've got cadmium will do both and osmium, but uh, we didn't really want to start with osmium um, because it's it's pretty it's pretty inert. Osmium three, it's D six, and it's also very toxic and expensive. So uh, we thought bismuth would be a better starting point. Yeah, and the second question is about more or less towards the end. You had this 1D chain-like thing, yes. and which was primarily with the chromium. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that gave rise to, because you had this idea of getting into hand and chain, mm -hmm. but can you do it also with copper, which is also yen teller, and it will be spin half, and maybe you will achieve a spin liquid phase. Yeah, you can, you can get something that's sort of a, you know, Lissinger liquid in that as well. Uh, that, that is known. Um, it is a, it's a 1D antiferromagnet. Yeah. Um, but is it possible with this thiocyanide? With the thiocyanate, yeah, so we, we've made copper 2 thiocyanate. I didn't show it in this talk. Um, copper 2 thiocyanate is uh, very 1D. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, you know, its interactions on your order about 80, 80 uh, Kelvin. It orders at about 11 Kelvin uh, into a conventional nail ground state with a sort of... So it's of not a spin liquid. Well, I mean, <laughs> above the ordering transition, it's a spin liquid, yeah. but maybe but not a very orders. strongly correlated it one. Orders. Yeah, okay. it doesn't Thanks. form a piles phase either. So. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Judith? Um, you mentioned the parallel with the um, quantum um, oxides, copper yes. oxide based materials and manganites. Um, but um, of course, they're so different. I mean, the structures are different, very much depending on the copper oxygen bond in the case of the cuprates mm -hmm. and the spin on the copper. So I don't. You know, and you said that with no doping, you know, you're antiferromagnetic and then some, you need precise doping to get to the, say, superconducting regime. But how are these... I don't see how they're similar. Yeah, sorry, I can, I can definitely spend a bit more time on it. So if you take the, copper, the chromium dichloride pyrazine example, um, it's sort of a, I guess, like a polarity inverted version of the copper oxides in some sense because... Or at least it's like you've electron doped it because you're starting... Sorry, here we go. So you've got a square. First off, sorry, you've got a square lattice of your of your metals already, and now you've got a 50%. You've got chromium three plus, so S equals three over two, with a half the uh, radicals, uh, half the uh, pyrazine things being uh, having electrons on them, being radicals. So there's really quite strong uh, coupling between them. This is a guess because no one's at, you know in the in the measurements that have been done on it, it's it's you know up to about 400 Kelvin, so we don't know what it is. Um, as far, I think some inelastic neutron scattering has been done, but saw nothing, which is telling you something already about it. So, I think in terms of the the analogy on the physics level, even though the chemistry is quite different, you're getting into the same kind of behaviour. You're, you're having sort of uh, strongly coupled chromium pyrazine pairs that are potentially, if you begin to reduce their concentration, become mobile. And, and so that's, I think, where, where it's going on. Perhaps it is completely different, but I think there's something interesting there regardless. Other questions or comments? I have one question for yes. your, your, your next slide. Uh, mm -hmm. So you were thinking about doping your materials, mm -hmm. and you showed that the earlier, uh, the previous slide, that you can make FCU or REU, which is 12 connected, now it connected, those are two different structures. Yeah. So are you planning to actually substitute the terminal ligands with this? Is that the plan? Or because those are still not defects in a sense because the coordination goes from 12 to 8 and you have four positions where you can put your ligands? Yeah, yeah. So I think I've been using defect in its more expansive sense. Um, so even... What, what I guess, even if you take the REO phase, so the REO phase, as far as I know, has not been made for, uh, in the UAO66 pure. It always occurs as a, as a domain structure within the other things on the sort of nanometer length scale. So yeah, we're, we're going to explore all kinds of different things in this. Um, and I think the defects are going to order over all kinds of length scales. So you could get a proper random solid solution, which would be interesting if you're perhaps if you're just really focused on ch changing the, the doping level in the material, if you're, if you're just having pure electron or, or hole doping and moving it up that way to something which is m looking much more like an, an ordered material. But it'll be across all those length scales. And I think that's perhaps another analogy to, to the manganites. So those, those manganese oxides, they have quite complicated defect structures over a lot of different length scales from being quite random to you know, stripe phases that are you know, similar to UIO66. So yeah. It's, it's a bit complicated, and we'll find out what happens. Um, Generally speaking, for the system that you have there, for the FCU, it all depends on the reaction conditions. 
yes. how fast it is and so on. But that's a cluster. So it means you have a band that carboxylate. But here I see that you are targeting more single metal coordination. Mm -hmm. So how are you planning to do that? Because those will be coordinated and you want to have them more defective when you grow your crystal. Then you can use that defect to coordinate again. Do you, do you have any preliminary data on this? You have so I think you're right that the specific kind of ligand vacancies that you see very commonly in UIO 66 are less likely Sorry, okay. less, less likely in the, in the monometallic systems. That's a very good point. Um, there is space to include capping ligands in a similar way if required. I don't think actually going to lower coordinate is necessarily always going to be the way to, to do it uh, in these things. We're, we're kind of more interested, perhaps in the first instance, in changing the electronic doping rather than, rather than vacancies. But yeah, that, that is a very good point. These are not going to do like you're not going to be able to take out half the uh, ligands and it, and it be <laughs> happy in the same structure. Um, Any other questions or comments? No? If not, please join me to thank Matthew. Great, Matt. Thanks.